بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Welcome to our brand new show here on Huda TV Missing Ingredients And before we say what this show is about we talk what this show is about because I know a lot of the viewers are like Missing Ingredients what are we going to be talking about? Before we talk about that I'm going to mention for you a few stories about our, er, the early Muslims and what they had. And perhaps you can understand what we'll be talking about after we mention some of these stories. And the first of these stories is the story of the great scholar of Islam, Muslim ibn Yassar, rahimahullah. And what happened with him, he was in the masjid. And he was praying when all of a the sudden there was a big boom. And everybody in the marketplace around the mosque was startled and scared because one of the walls in the masjid had collapsed. And when they looked inside the masjid, they saw Muslim Ibn Yassar rahimahullah, still standing in his prayer. He hadn't moved, hadn't been startled, and didn't notice that one of the walls in the masjid had fallen down. Uh, Urad Ibn Zubayr rahimahullah, had also a gotten sick one time and had to amputate one of his body parts and they wanted to give him something to numb the pain. Not something haram, but just something that would numb the pain and he refused to take it. So one of his relatives said, what you need to do with Urwa, Urwa is when he gets into the prayer, go ahead and go ahead and amputate the leg. The doctor was like, are, are you crazy? Are you serious? And he said, believe me, trust me, he won't even move. He won't flinch if he's in the prayer. So he went and he started to pray and they came and they amputated his leg after that, during the prayer. And he didn't move, didn't flinch. Another story that happened, and this was between oh, the Sahaba themselves. It was one of the Ansar and one of the Muhajireen from the Sahaba that uh, they were left to guard the Muslims during one of their campaigns. And they decided as they were up in, in, at night uh, guarding the Muslims that they, one of them would sleep and the other one would uh, keep a lookout. And then he'd wake up his, his partner and they would take turns like that. So the one as he was sitting there, the one who was on duty, he said, let me go ahead and pray and benefit from my time. So he started to pray, and he really got into it as he's reading, and he's getting into it. And you know what I'm talking about, because you, sometimes you found that in your prayer where you really, really get into it. You can feel it. Your tilawah is really nice, and you're really getting into it. You're pumped up, and you're feeling the pleasure of the prayer. So he was in one of those modes. He was in that zone. When the, one of the enemies had snuck up from behind, and he saw him praying, and he heard him reading the Quran a little bit, he said, okay, so if I'm going to sneak up on the Muslims, he said, the first guy I got to take out is the one on duty. So he takes out his arrow, takes out his bow, and poof, shoots the, the, the Muslim who was praying from the Sahaba, from the Ansar. When he got hit by the arrow, obviously he felt it, but he didn't want to get out of that zone. He felt so good in the prayer during that time. He didn't want to leave that feeling, so he kept on praying. I was like, what's this guy? Didn't even move. And he said, I know I got him. He said, okay, number two. So he pulls out the second arrow, whoosh, shoots him again. He hits him. He knows he hits him. But he's still praying, hasn't, hasn't left the prayer. He's still reading, still reciting. The guy said, what is this guy? Two times I shoot the guy and he still hasn't moved, still hasn't flinched, still hasn't made any noise. He said, what is this? He takes out the third arrow and shoots him again. Now imagine you've been shot two times. The third one hits. Now this one was a little more painful. The pain overcame a little bit. So he said, after this, uh, he, made a, he made a noise like, oh, he got hit on the third one. This little noise woke up his partner, his companion who was on duty with him, who, who was guarding with him. And he saw that his companion had been shot three times with three arrows. And when he asked him, why didn't you wake me up? It's, not, it's the Nafil prayer. Why didn't you just wake, wake me up and tell me something was happening? And he told him because of the pleasure I was feeling. I was re reflecting on the ayat, and I didn't want to get out of that zone I was in. Now, from these three stories, perhaps you realize now what the missing ingredients is all about and what we're going to be talking about in this show. We're going to be talking about in this show, inshallah tabarakah wa ta'ala, what we are missing in our prayers. Why did these early Muslims find this type of pleasure in the prayer? They couldn't even be distracted by it. And why do we, when we're in our, our prayers, we're so into the dunya? Thinking about what we need to think about, uh, think about the dunya, not thinking about the prayer, not focusing on the prayer. Sometimes we go into the prayer and we don't even know what happened in the prayer. We don't know what the imam read 
in the prayer. Or what happened? We're like, oh, it's already, we're already finished. SubhanAllah. So what are we missing in our prayer that they had? What are the ingredients they had that we don't have? That's what we're going to be looking into, inshallah, in this show here on Hudu TV, inshallah ta'ala. We're going to know in detail what we need to do, how to overcome this, so we can find the pleasure in our prayer. We're going to look into the secrets of the prayer. And a lot of things we're going to be talking about, which a lot of people don't know, is not just in the prayer itself. There's a lot of things, as these next few episodes we're going to be talking about, inshallah, it's going to be about what comes before the prayer that has effect on you in the prayer in itself. When we look at the issue of the prayer, it has so much importance in Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He mentioned in Surah Al-Mu'minun, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ When He mentioned that verily the believers are successful. The first thing He mentioned, الَّذِينَ The ones whom فِي صِلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ That they're in their prayers, they have khushur. They have khushur in their prayers. This is the first thing that He mentioned about them when He started mentioning their different characteristics. That they are in their prayers khashi'un. They have khushur. They're in a humble statement. They're reflecting on the meanings in the prayers. They're benefiting from the prayers. They know the reality of the prayer. The Prophet ﷺ knew the reality of the prayer. And that's why he used to say to his mu'adhin, Bilal radiallahu an, Arihna biha, biha ya Bilal. Let us relax through the prayer, ya Bilal. Let us relax through the prayer. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He told us as well, because He knows, He's our Creator, He knows what we need. He knows that we're going to face difficulties in this life. He knows that life is not going to be easy. It's a test. It's the dunya. The test if you're going to be successful here, where you're going to be in the hereafter. Either to the Jannah, to the paradise, which has seven rivers that flows beneath it. Or you're going to be in the torment of the hellfire. May Allah protect us from that. Which, where you're going to go? And you're being tested here in this, in this world, in this dunya. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gave us the cure, the ability to find peace of heart to find peace of mind, to be able to deal with these difficulties. So was the, he said to us, salat, And seek assistance through patience and your prayer. We have the solution, but unfortunately we don't use it. The Prophet ﷺ, he taught us, when he taught his companions as well, when he said, Arihna biha ya Bilal. Let us relax through the prayer, O Bilal. Let us find the relaxation through the prayer. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, that it, when he mentioned the things that he loves from this dunya, and I want you, before I go on, to think just for a second. What's the first thing that pops into your head? The things that you love of this dunya. Think about them. What are the things that you love from this dunya, from this life that you live in? Think about it. A lot of people now, different things are popping into their heads. The Prophet wasallam, he mentioned three things. And the third of those three, and the most beloved thing to him in this dunya, he said, the coolness of my eyes. The thing that really helps me relax, the thing that I really love in this, in this life. He said, it's in the prayer. Qurat al ain the coolness of the eyes in the prayer. Because he knew the benefit that he got from Ali salatu wasalam. And when he put into the prayer, he focused on the prayer, he knew what he found, the tranquility he found in the prayer. Look at the early Muslims that we mentioned and what they found through their prayer. Is it possible? Here's the question now. Is it possible that we can find this tranquility? Is it possible that we can find this peace of heart and this peace of mind in the prayer that we can benefit from it? No doubt it is. And inshallah, if you tune in with us here on Huda TV to these episodes, inshallah, you're going to benefit and you're going to find a life-changing experience, inshallah ta'ala, through the mercy of Allah in your prayers. And you're going to feel something, inshallah, that you haven't felt, inshallah, in your prayers before. And this is something that everybody who has attended this course that I have given, or, and, and which is going to be on this show as well, that they have found the change in their prayer, the peace of heart that they have found, the tranquility they have found. There's so many things that we never even think about. The prayer has become like a custom to Muslims today. It's an action that they do. Not thinking about the meanings behind what they say. Every movement, it has something behind it. Every statement has something behind it. It's very deep, in-depth. We don't think about these things. But when you start to focus on them, you're going to say, SubhanAllah, I never thought of that. And it's going to help you, inshallah, and it's going to bring your prayer to a whole other level. Once you find, inshallah ta'ala, the missing ingredients that been, has been missing from your prayer, inshallah tabarak wa ta'ala. My dear brothers in Islam, when we look at the early Muslims, even some of the Muslims today who have found this tranquility, 
the great Tabi'i from the Tabi'een, Sa'id al Musayyib, Rahimahullah. He was somebody who was well known for close guarding his prayer. He said that for 40 years he never missed the first takbirah of the salat. The first takbirah, Allah Akbar, he never missed it for 40 years. And he said about himself, he said, 20 of those I never saw the shoulders of men. Pay attention. He said, 40 years I never missed the first takbirah. The first takbirah, Allah Akbar. And then when the prayer starts in the masjid, he said, I never missed it. And he said that the time for a prayer never came except that I missed it. Mushtaq ilayha. He said, I was mi I'm missing the prayer. He was so happy, so relieved when he heard Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. He was so relieved to hear it. He yearned for the prayer. And that's why he strove to be there in the masjid where he should be as a man. That he said for 20 years, for 40 years I never missed it, the first takbir. 20 of them, I never saw the shoulder of men, meaning that he was never on the second row. He was always in the first row because he knew what he got from the prayer. When he put into it, he knew that he would get back what the Prophet ﷺ got and what the companions got. And this is, inshallah ta'ala, what we're going to try to accomplish through these episodes, inshallah ta'ala. Wa ta when we look at the Muslim, we are different categories when it comes to the prayer. Now, I'm going to mention for you, as Ibn al Qayyim mentioned, Rahimullah, that the people, when it comes to the prayer, there are four or five different categories that you might fall into. And I want you to pay close attention to these categories because you are going to be, no doubt, fall into one of these categories. So you need to ask yourself which one you are. And you ask yourself where you want to go with your prayer. And the thing is, is that we as Muslims, we have to pray five times a day. It's not an option. You can pray sometimes, leave sometimes. That's not an option for a Muslim. You have to pray. So when you, but when you get back from the prayer, you benefit from it. Because in the reality, you're the one benefiting from it. And a lot of us think about some of the benefits that we benefit from the prayer is that we lose our sins. We're doing our duty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is true. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, he mentioned that the one who prays five times a day. And he mentioned the guy who has the river in front of his house. And it's like he takes a bath in it every time he leaves his house. He said, would any of the, would there be any dirt left on him? The Sahaba said, no, of course not. And he said like this, the prayer. When you go out and you pray like this, you're going to have all of your sins, inshallah, to baraka wa ta'ala, forgiven. And also we know the benefits that we benefit from the prayer as well is that the emotional side, that it keeps us away from that which harms us, from the bad deeds, from the evil deeds. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he said to us, the very the, the prayer it forbids us or from falling or doing that which is evil, that which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of that is from the benefits of the prayer that we benefit. So we need to focus on reviving the prayer, seeing what is the missing ingredients in the prayer. And as we do this, inshallah, we're going to talk about these categories to see where you are at the start here, to see which one you are. Now these categories... I'm going to mention about five of them. The first of these categories is the one who has oppressed himself. How has he oppressed himself? He's oppressed himself because he is not performing the prayer correctly. That which is the pillar of the prayer, which is the compulsory actions he must do in the prayer. All of this he is not doing properly. The prayer is not correct if he doesn't have the, the proper pillars of the salat, the arkan. If he doesn't do what he's supposed to do in the prayer, the prayer won't be corrected. His wudu perhaps is not correct because he doesn't really focus on these things. He just does it as, an, as a custom, as an action without benefiting anything from the prayer. So this person is the one who has oppressed himself by not benefiting and not gaining anything from the prayer. Alhamdulillah, he prays as a Muslim, but he's not gaining anything out of it. During the prayer, he's not even thinking about what's going on in the prayer, what he should be saying and what he's not saying. And the second category that we're going to be talking about, that we need to mention after the first category, we're going to mention inshallah, but after this short break inshallah, so stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It's the essence of Islam, Ta'aqeed. Believing in the oneness of Allah, the same message that Allah sent all His prophets with since the beginning of time. La ilaha illallah. You need Tawheed. Especially 
at the time of distress, at the time of need. Tawheed first with Imam Kareem Abu Zaid in Ramadan only on Huda TV. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to this episode of Missing Ingredients, where we're taking an in-depth look into our prayer to see what's missing. What are we missing in our prayer? And what did the Prophet Sallallahu and the Sahaba and the early Muslims, how did they gain so much and benefit so much from the prayer where we ourselves are lost in our prayer? And before our break, we were talking about the different categories of the people when it comes to their prayer to see where we fall as Muslims in our prayer. And we talked about the first category, the ones who have oppressed themselves by not doing their prayer cor correctly, not doing their wudu correctly. And even those, they fall into the same category of the ones who don't pray on time. How do they pray, but they might pray a little bit late sometimes. Or you'll find them combining the prayers. And you're amazed at the Muslim when they know the status of the prayer, that they don't really pay attention or benefit anything from it. And that's what we're trying to solve, inshallah, in this show, so we can revive our prayers and bring it back to life. Now we reach the second category. Now this is the one, alhamdulillah, he close guards on his prayer, meaning that he prays all of the time. And he does uh, all of the you know, wajibat, the things that are compulsory in the, the prayer, and the arkan, the pillars of the prayer, everything, to make the prayer correctly. So he knows his prayer, he does it correctly, he close guards on the time, but he doesn't benefit anything from his prayer because he's so busy with the shaitan. Now pay attention to this. He prays correctly. You know, he's, he knows, for example that he's, spo and he's supposed to be standing, reading the fact to have these arkan, pillars of the salat. The prayer is not correct without these. He knows that it's wajib to do this. It's sunnah to do this. He knows these things. And mashallah, he knows when, as a Muslim, when it's time for dhuhr, he prays dhuhr. When it's time for asr, he prays asr. But he goes in and comes out with no benefit whatsoever. Why? Because shaitan has taken over his prayer. And you know what I'm talking about. Because it's happened to a lot of us. Where shaitan, we go in, we don't know what happened in the prayer. It's like a daze. Boom, boom, boom. We're doing the movements. We're praying correctly, might have been praying according to the sunnah, but don't get anything out from the prayer. And I'm going to tell you a story. It happened in a Muslim country where there was a guy, alhamdulillah, he was and he, the best of, of the people there at the market, or it seems so anyways, where he used to lead them in the prayer every day. And he was a businessman just like them, had, had his shops and doing his business. And one day he sat down, which they said was the third rakah, and or they said that he had sat down what he thought was the fourth rakat, and they thought it was the third rakat. So they were saying to him, Subhanallah, for him to get up, and he didn't budge. They said, Subhanallah, and he didn't move, because they think he's only, he's sitting down to the third, and he's sure it's the fourth. And that's correct. If you're sure, the Imam you're not supposed to move, by the way. So he didn't move. He was he was sure. He was certain. Subhanallah, he didn't move. And he says, Salam alaykum rahmatullah. Salam alaykum rahmatullah. They said, Hajj. They said, You you pay you prayed only. Uh, three rakats. He said, no, I prayed four. They said, no, three, four. They keep going back and forth. Now he's getting a little upset because he's sure he prayed four. And then everybody's telling him, no, you prayed three. So he has to prove his argument. He said, look, I'm going to tell you guys something. He said, no, I'm, I'm going to tell you I'm right 110%. They said, no, you're not. He said, I'm going to prove it to you. He said, look, he said, every day I lead you guys in door. And he said, I have a system in my life that I do. He said, because I have four shops here in the marketplace with you guys. In the souk. He said, I have four shops here. And he said, I go to the big shop in the first rakah, because that's longer. And I see what I've done, what needs to be done in the prayer. And then he said, I go to the second rakah, to the smaller store. And then I go to the third store, in the third rakah. And then I go to the fourth store, to the smallest one, because the and I, and I finish everything there that needs to be done. We need to buy anything, missing some products, what's been done, what needs to be done. We have a shipment coming in, a shipment going out. He said, I handle all this during the prayer. So he said, I went to all four stores today. So he said, there's no way that I didn't pray for rakat. Ya yeah, subhanallah, ya yeah, mashallah. And you, you're in the prayer, but you're thinking about the dunya. So mashallah, he's leading the prayer. And perhaps he's doing all the things he's supposed to do in the prayer, but his mind is not there. So he's not benefiting anything from the prayer. That's the second category. Now the third category is the one who close guards it. And he's very similar to the second one, but he's better than him because he's fighting off the whispers of shaitan more, focusing a little bit, and then shaitan takes over. So he's in a sirat. He's at, like in a battle with shaitan, in the, like the second one who's completely gone. He's in a battle with shaitan. So he's not really benefiting from the prayer itself, 
all of the time. Sometimes he does, alhamdulillah, but a lot of times shaitan is getting the best of him. He's constantly fighting shaitan and trying to battle with him, which you're supposed to be doing. But when it becomes too much, you're going to find that you're not benefiting from the prayer. And this third person, he's the one who's missing a lot of the ingredients of the prayer that we're going to be missing, inshallah. The fourth category is the one who has done everything that he's supposed to be doing, inshallah, in the prayer. And he is focusing on the prayer. And he has defeated shaitan in the prayer. And he's benefiting everything he, 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 that he should from the prayer. Okay? This is the fourth category. An almost perfect prayer. And, but there's a fifth category. It's a little bit better than the, than the fourth category. Fourth, alhamdulillah, is prayer. Nothing can really be said about it except for it hasn't reached to the highest level. Because when you look at the stories we mentioned at the beginning of the episode, a guy has his, his leg amputated in the prayer and he's not moving. That's, that's the high level. And somebody, a wall collapsing in the masjid. And he's still concentrated, hasn't moved. Another story about another one, when there's a big fire next to the masjid, he stood in prayer, didn't move. And this is a very high level. So see, this fifth category, they said this is the one, it's like he's taking his heart out and put it in, in front. He's standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, worshiping Allah as the Prophet sallallahu said, at, well, from the state of Ihsan. It's as if you can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but even if you can't see him, then verily he can see you. As the Prophet said, said in, the same, in the famous hadith, the hadith of Jibreel. This is that high level. He's put his heart in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not for nothing. And he's at a, a, very high state, a very high level of iman and tranquility during his prayer. These are the basic five levels of the Muslims who pray, alhamdulillah, when it comes to their prayers. Now I want all of you to focus. All of the viewers at home, ask yourself, which one of the five are you? Which one are you? Are you number one? Na'udhi billah, it's really bad. Number two is also bad. Three, maybe a lot fall into that category. But you know, where do you want to go? Do you want to be number four or do you want to be number five? Do you want to be the ones who find the tranquility? Or are you going to be from the ones who when they hear the adhan, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, ya salam, they find, they find inside this type of tranquility and excitement for the prayer. They want to go and get ready. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who used to be with his wives, in the service of his wives, he used to help out around the house, help out with the chores. But this, as, as Aisha said, radiallahu anha, but when the adhan was called, when it came time for the prayer, it was as if he didn't know us, because that was time for the prayer. When it's time for the prayer, he would immediately go to the prayer. So you need to ask yourself, which one of the five are you, and where do you want to go? Where do you want to be with your prayer? Now, when we look at the prayer and the issue of the khushur, finding tranquility in the prayer, we see there's a lot of reasons behind it. A lot of reasons for benefiting from the prayer. And we're going to look now, we're going to start talking about the missing ingredients today, but we're not going to reach the prayer in today's episode. We want to talk about some of the things that come between the prayer. And one of the greatest of these is knowing the status of the prayer itself, the reality of the prayer itself. It's said that Ali ibn al Hussein, radiallahu an, that if he made wudu, his color would change. He would become a little bit, he would become yellow in color, like out of fear. So people were like, you know, what's wrong with you? Why does the color, your color change when you're, when you're making wudu? You're about to pray. He said, Do you know who I'm about to stand in front of? Do you know who I'm about to stand in front of? This is the reality. He knew the status of the prayer. He knew the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he was about to stand in front of. And that's why he had reached that level, that high level in his prayer. Changing colors because he's about to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now look at so many Muslims say when it comes to the prayer. <coughs> you see how lazy they are in their prayers. Hand here, hand there, doesn't care how he prays. Foot out in the front, and the, the, la the lazy man stance we call it. One foot in the front, doesn't. And he playing with this and that, changing his hair, clothes. Even you see people sometimes, I would be picking their nose in the prayer. No, you've seen him. You might be one of them. Got his finger in his nose during the prayer. Some people with the, with the phone, in, in the prayer, playing with the phone during the prayer. Not actually taking out. That's a, that's a whole other level. But I'm saying, doing things in the prayer he shouldn't be doing. When you when you walk in front of people sometimes, like in the masjid, you walk and some of the masjids have the windows in the front. How many people do you see looking at you? 
Because from the sunnah, where are you supposed to be looking? You're supposed to be looking down at the ground, at the place of sujood. And it's one of the things, that's gonna, we're going to talk about this later in more detail. But where do you find people looking at you? They're looking at you as you're walking by. You're like, a'udhi billah. And the guy, he, he follows you the whole way, man. And he, as, you're, as you're walking through, subhanAllah. Why? Because he's in the motions, his body's there, but he's not benefiting th- anything from the prayer. He's not benefiting anything. So this is what we're going to look into, and we're running out of time in today's episode, and we're going to continue, inshallah, next episode, talking about the missing ingredients, what we're missing in our prayer, and how we can get these missing ingredients and put them into our prayer so we can find the pleasure of the prayer. So our prayer will become the coolness of our eyes. So we'll become excited and yearning for the prayer when it comes to the time, and we're out of time in today's episode. Unfortunately, we'll continue, inshallah, our next episode. And until then, Allah knows best. Allahu alam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Muhammad. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته